Dreambender, Chapter 10, From the Point of View of Jeremy. You did what? Arthur's eyes blazed. He gripped my arm. I wouldn't have guessed he was so strong. I decided not to bend or dream, I said. It was so beautiful. It was the following night, and Arthur had come back to check on me. Beautiful, he said. Of course it was beautiful. What's that got to do with it? I couldn't bring myself to change it. I thought maybe, I don't know, maybe the plan was wrong. So he let go of my arm. This is my fault. I wasn't strict enough. You were so gifted, I thought you'd understand. Understand what, I asked. We don't question the plan. We do it. That's all. It's created by people, I said. People make mistakes. Arthur sighed. It's not a question of mistakes. It's about patterns. The watchers don't just make them up or decide on a whim. We don't flip a coin. The patterns are woven over months and years. Each decision is based on the ones before it and the next decision on that. But you have a choice, don't you? You could change things. Within limits, but not outside the plan. If we never change the pattern, life keeps going straight down the path. Tomorrow is like today. Today is like yesterday. What kind of world is that? A solid one, Arthur said. A safe one. A dull one, I said. Arthur grunted. You would have liked the warming. There was plenty of excitement then. Look, Arthur, I let her sing. Is that really so bad? It was music, Arthur said. The look in his eyes was the same as one I'd seen in Dorothy's. To me, music was beautiful. To them, it was frightening. Arthur's shoulders slumped. We're about to find out how bad it is. You have to hear above, you have to appear above the council. If you didn't look closely, it would seem like an ordinary sort of place. There was a little cottage on the island with green shutters and stone walls. Who would have guessed that night after night? It was where the watchers decided the fate of the world. Arthur took me there in one of the boats. It was a trip that I'd always wanted to make, but not under these circumstances. Just tell them the truth, Arthur said as we rowed. It's all you can do. We pulled the boat up onto the island and made the short walk to the cottage where Arthur opened the door and motioned me inside. The place seemed bigger than it did from the outside. We were in a room with windows along two sides. The walls were dotted with lamps and at one end of the room was a fireplace with flames that fluttered up the chimney but didn't seem to heat the room. In the center was a large, flat table with a few chairs. A big sheet of paper had been spread across the table and pencils were scattered nearby. I whispered to Arthur, Is that? He nodded. The plan. The one for tonight. Two watchers, a man and a woman, leaned over the table and spoke in low voices. Others circled around, talking among themselves, taking notes on clipboards, usually checking with the, occasionally checking with the man and woman. The watchers would nod and write something on their clipboards, then move off past a neatly printed sign on the wall. Never meet the dreamer. Never harm the dreamer. Always follow the plan. At the end of the table was another sheet of paper that had been rolled up and tied with string. As we watched, a man came by and picked it up. Carrying it to the fireplace, he opened the screen and set the paper inside where it smoked, then burst into flame. The others watch. The other watchers stopped what they were doing and gazed into the fire until the paper had disappeared up the chimney. That was last night's plan, Arthur explained. Why did he burn it, I asked. Today is paper. Tomorrow is fire. Yesterday is smoke. I had heard the expression once, since I was little. Now I knew where it came from. It's a tradition, said Arthur. It reminds us that we shouldn't dwell on the past. I had another thought, but didn't say it. Burning the plan kept the work secret. If no one saw it, they couldn't question it. After a few minutes, the woman at the table looked up and smiled. Hello, Arthur. Turning to me, she said, you must be Jeremy. Yes, ma'am. Arthur told me to be polite. Dreambenders always were, he said, out of respect for one another and for the job. Follow me, please, said the woman. Where are we going? I asked. To the council chamber. Growing up, my friends and I had learned about the council. We knew there were three council members and they ruled on big issues and problems, one of which apparently was me. The council met on the island in a special chamber in the cottage. The woman led us through a door into a smaller room. The walls were paneled in wood. In the middle of the room was a long desk with three chairs behind it and a gavel resting on top. A fourth chair was on the near side facing the desk. A man and woman sat behind the desk in two of the chairs. Like the watchers, they wore robes, but these were a deep maroon. The third chair was empty, as was the fourth. The woman who had brought us into the room led me to the fourth chair and I sat down. Arthur stood behind me. This is Jeremy Finn, the woman said. She bowed slightly and then left. I waited. 
Arthur told me that besides being polite, I had to be patient. It wasn't my best quality. I leaned over to him. Is this the council? How come there are just two of them? Who sits in the third chair? He shot me a look. I knew that look. Shut up. A moment later, another door opened and a woman entered wearing a hooded robe. She settled into the empty chair and pushed back the hood to, re ho hood to reveal a face I knew well. Dorothy, I said. Covering my mouth, I mumbled. Oops. Sorry. Hello, Jeremy, she said. I see you're as eager as ever, and you still haven't learned to follow the rules. Are you on the counselor? She's the chairman, said the man to her left, whose name I, st I learned was Ching Lee. Some people say she is the council. Dorothy waved off the remark. We're all the council. I thought you were just a trainer, I said. She stared at me. Jeremy, training is our most important job. I thought of Leif and the way he used to quote Carlton Reigns. Shape a dream, shape a life, shape a world. Apparently, they really believed it. The woman next to Dorothy shifted uncom uncomfortably in her chair. Can we get started? Dorothy straightened up and nodded. You're right, Louisa. This is a hearing, not a school lesson. Arthur, tell us about the case. Arthur stood up, stepped up beside my chair and described our work together, mentioning the big dreams I had worked on and the stubborn dream he had brought me. There was music, Arthur explained. I thought he could bend it. He has unusual powers. At the mention of music, I could see the three of them tense up. Something frightening had entered the room. Go on, said Dorothy. When Arthur told them about the singer's dream, Ching Lee gaped at me. You didn't bend it? You let her sing? It was beautiful, I said. I stopped, remembering what Arthur had told me. If I argued, the punishment might be worse. And no matter who was in charge or how well I thought I knew her, punishment was what the hearing was about. Jeremy was on his own, said Arthur, as he should have been. As we all are, he made a mistake. Louisa shook her head. He ignored the plan. He defied it. He's young, said Arthur. He shows great potential. He always has, Dorothy said, studying me. I wondered what she saw. Ching Lee said, potential is a sword. It cuts two ways. In the wrong hands, it can kill. I didn't hurt anyone, I said. I knew I should have kept quiet, but I hadn't done anything wrong, and I certainly wasn't a killer. I helped her. In the dream, she was happy. You should have seen her. Dorothy looked up at Arthur. How did you respond? She asked him. This evening, I discovered what Jeremy had done. When she dreamed again, I made a repair. She'll be fine. A repair, I said. You bent her dream? Silence! It was a voice I had never heard Dorothy use, cold like steel. She spoke as a stranger. Be grateful, young man. You may not know it, but Arthur saved you. Punishment is based on damage. Arthur repaired yours so you won't get the ultimate penalty. At least not this time. The ultimate penalty? Banishment from the dreamscape forever. I tried to imagine it, a life without dreams except my own. For someone who roamed the dreamscape the way children play in the grass, it was impossible to imagine. Dorothy said, we'll be easy on you this time thanks to Arthur. You mean I can still bend dreams? She looked at me as if I'd lost my mind. Bend dreams? You can't even look at dreams. Lifting the gavel, she pounded the desk. It sounded like a rifle shot. You're banned from the dreamscape for one year. Afterward, coming back into the boat with Arthur, I gazed at the nighttime sky. Usually I saw dreams there. There were pictures, sounds, feelings, another world. Now that world was closed to me. Can I at least visit the dreamscape, I asked Arthur. You know, as a guest, I won't change anything. He stared at me. Don't you understand? You're banned. If anyone sees you in the dreamscape, the ban won't be just for a year. It'll be for life. A breeze blew over the water. It was warm, but I shivered. Arthur dropped me at the far dreaming field and moved off toward the other watchers. He spoke with them and they glanced in my direction. I wondered what they were thinking. Jeremy Finn, screw up. Jeremy Finn, outlaw. Jeremy Finn, criminal. I looked across the field. Dream benders were moving about in this world, but living in another one. It would be a long time before I could join them. Until then, what would I do? What could I do? Sit on the grass, stare into space? When I stared, what would I see? Are you okay? 
Turning around, I saw Gracie. Her dark eyes were troubled. I tried to smile. I'm fine. Hannah and Philip came up behind her. Philip nodded toward the island. What happened over there? I started to make something up, then stopped. What was the use? One way or another, they would find out. So I told them, starting with the boat ride and ending with the council's ruling. Usually, Hannah would laugh and say something funny. Today, she wasn't smiling. There was music. You didn't follow the plan? You should have seen this dream, I said. You should have heard it. Philip shook his head. I hope it was good. Over his shoulder, I saw Leif watching us from a distance. I tried to read his expression, but couldn't. I wanted to rush over and tell him what had happened. Somehow, though, without knowing how or why, I had a feeling he already knew.